Mr. Alec, uh, Alec Kalak. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much, Miu Yam, Natong Alec Kalak Yaka, Naon Atau Palmangai, No Tangalish UC San Diego, Unga Tangalish Pilachin Langa Palachik. Um, good morning, everyone, or I guess almost good afternoon, uh, depending on where you're tuning in from. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Pre-Med CC for the introduction, um, as well as um, creating the space for me to share um, a little bit about what led me to my current training uh, here at UC San Diego and San Diego State. Um, a few things um, you know, before we get started. Um, you know, my perspective is my own, and I always like to say, um, you know, when you listen to someone's story and you know what they share, it can be very um, personal. So, you know, take take what you learn. Um, you know, not not necessarily what was said, um, and those lessons can be very impactful. Um, you know, depending on where you are um, in your um, respective uh, training programs. So um, I'm currently a fourth year MD PhD student at UC San Diego School of Medicine and Herbert Wertheim School of Public Health and Human Longevity Science. Um, I am kind of the odd person who decided uh, not just to go to medical school, but to go to graduate school at the same time. Uh, so the way that works is that I have done half of medical school um, and then I took a uh, leave to start my PhD. I'm about halfway done with that. Um, and as um, our gracious host um, pointed out, uh, my focus um, in my PhD program is really around vaccine hesitancy and misinformation and just really trying to promote strong public health uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, it's not something that I necessarily thought that I was going to be um, focusing on during my PhD, but I always like to think that the work that I, um, you know, the work that I do or the work that I'm doing should have a purpose and you, sh you shouldn't just do research um, just to do research. Um, and that's um, really because I kind of uh, prioritize kind of collectivism over um, kind of individual success. Um, so I really uh, want to do work that's for um, the community, um, not necessarily uh, for myself. Uh, so a little bit about uh, me and the time that we have here. Um, I was born and raised in uh, Southern California in San Diego. Uh, my dad was um, applying to medical school right around the time that I was born. So uh, we spent the first few years of my life living in Boston, um, you know, kind of on a whim. My father, who grew up on uh, the Palma Indian Reservation, you know, areas where um, Native Americans were relocated and told to live, um, decided to, um, you know, leave home to go to college, um, decided to go to medical school, um, and applied to Harvard Medical School. And I think uh, what he always told me, or continues to tell me, is that, you know, they, they took a shot on him um, and saw, saw this potential that he didn't necessarily see in himself. Um, and I think that um, really uh, struck a chord in that, um, you know, he was very successful um, in, in Boston. And then we eventually moved back to uh, California for his residency training. And uh, fortuitously, um, he's now been the medical director of the same Indian Health Service Clinic where he grew up uh, seeking care for the last uh, 20 years. And I share that because in talking about my story, you know, it doesn't necessarily begin with me. It begins with those who came before me. You know, it begins with my father, um, you know, his his parents, their parents, um, and all and all the ancestors who came before you, uh, fighting for the future that you have today. Um, so my philosophy that I've really um, kind of adapted in the last few years is, you know, how how can I be a good ancestor? What can I do now to promote health equity and create a better future for those who come after me? You know, not just for my own uh, my own people, my own tribe, um, but for all um, for all people um, you know in the world, especially among the most uh, marginalized. I I really thought that when I was growing up in San Diego that I would be going to um, you know, college and medical school, um, all, all here in California. But, um, you know, the way that it worked out, I actually was, uh, turned away from, uh, many of the colleges that I applied to in California around, uh, 10 years ago. 
Um, and the college that I was accepted to, um, California uh, State University or CSU San Marcos, um, it was about a five minute drive from my house. And I, I said to myself, you know, if I, if I go here, you know, I'll, I'll probably live at home. I'll probably be comfortable. Um, I don't know if that will challenge me to kind of get out of my comfort zone because um, I was uh, pretty kind of shy, introverted, um, you know, kind of uh, teen at the time. So I decided, you know, why not try out of state? You know, what's, what's close by? And the choice that I came to um, in 2011, 2012 um, was the University of Arizona. Um, you know, a quick uh, like seven hour drive, a one hour flight um, in a city that I used to call uh, Tucson, uh, Arizona, because I had no clue how to pronounce Tucson. Um, but Tucson became a second home. And I always tell um, a story sometimes about how I came to choose my major because you have to specify your major on your college application. And, you know, as I was like 17 at the time, I was confronted with this list of like 200 like different majors. And I was like, okay, there's communications, there's biology, there's arts, there's engineering. Um, you know, what do I pick? And I asked my dad uh, when he was busy uh, doing his medical charting, and he told me, you know, pick something that sounds cool. You know, pick something that, you know, you think is interesting. I was like, okay, and I picked biochemistry. And then I get to, um, I get to college, I get my classes, and I see all these requirements um, for um, like advanced, super advanced calculus and all these subjects that I know that I have like a strong difficulty with. And I was like, mm, maybe not for me, let's do something a little bit more, um, more applied or something that I can really, you know, wrap my head around because I'm a naturally kind of curious person and I like understanding how um, kind of uh, system, like different systems operate in biology. So I uh, made a pivot about a few months in and I changed to uh, neuroscience and cognitive science. Um, the university at the time uh, was the first, uh, first university to have an undergraduate program in neuroscience and cognitive science. So it was kind of, you know, doing something really new and all the faculty were also doing something really new. And I was having um, a really great time academically, but I wasn't necessarily having a great time socially because, you know, I traded the West Coast for the Sonoran Desert. I left all of my friends. I didn't know, um, I, I had no, um, I had no community. And for me, community is one of the most important things. Um, so I, you know, started looking around at student clubs and organizations. I found the um, American Indian Science and Engineering Society, uh, SACNAS, the Society for Advancement of Chicanos, Hispanics, and Native Americans in Science. Um, and they were all at this event called um, the Finding Community Welcome. Um, it was welcoming students from all backgrounds and showing them that you know, there's a place for you here, not just, you know, not just statements, but like physical places. So um, I started hanging out at Native American Student Affairs. I started going to um, the research events, the social events, like the, the, the morning pancakes for finals week. Um, and I found, I found my people, I found my community. Um, and that really helped me succeed um, not just academically, but also in my um, extracurricular studies. And um, I went on to um, you know, have a pretty good grade point average. It wasn't a 4.0 by any means. Um, you know, I added, a, I, I added a minor in biochemistry. I added a minor in computer science. I removed the minor in computer science. Um, and all of that to say that, you know, your path isn't always um, isn't always linear. Um, you know, it's it's good to kind of branch out and try things, but then being comfortable letting them go if they don't work. Um, and that's a lesson that I learned um, uh, learned very quickly um, at the University of Arizona is that you don't have to be, um, you know, the kind of the expert in everything. You should be an expert in one thing or two things and then learn to work with others who are also experts um, and kind of put that emphasis on um, on team building and being um, being collaborative because I think when you start to welcome 
different perspectives to the table, that's when you really start to get novel solutions to the problems that society faces. And, um, you know, given that my focus was in um, basic sciences um, or neuroscience, I was really wanting to um, gain more research experience. And a mentor of mine said, you know, have you considered the National Institutes of Health, the NIH? And I was like, what, what is the NIH? Um, you know, start looking it up, seeing that it's, you know, a huge funder of research in the US. Um, they have summer internships. And I, I, you know, on a whim, I was like, you know, it's in, it's in Maryland. Like, should I do that? Should I go further away from home? Because in my mind, the farther away you go from home, the less likely you are to return home and bring back, um, you know, what you've learned in your training. And, you know, I told myself, you know, if my, um, excuse me, if my, um, if my dad can do it, I can do it. And, you know, I, I had that stay with me at the time and said, you know, let's, let's do it. Um, so I ended up spending every summer of college um, at the National Institutes of Health, you know, working in the same laboratory, working with the same mentors. Um, and, you know, it was really exciting to, you know, not just read about science, but to do science. Um, but interestingly, interest, interestingly enough, um, what I was learning um, in my research projects, I learned the following, um, the following year academically. So I was kind of applying, I was learning like how to do something in the real world and then learning about it um, in a textbook. And that kind of real world experience, I think speaks to the importance of doing, um, you know, internships, externships, um, you know, just to get that perspective and that lived experience, but also acknowledging that, you know, many of these internships or positions um, aren't really, um, you know, most, most inclusive of students from underrepresented backgrounds. Um, oftentimes, um, they're unpaid. Um, you, you might get academic credit for them. Um, and those are big um, barriers for students who come from uh, marginalized backgrounds. So I was very fortunate that my internships um, were paid and I didn't have that extra um, financial burden. And when I graduated from U of A, I had kind of pushed off taking um, the MCAT. You know, I, I wanted to take some time off and do um, more research at the National Institutes of Health um, because, you know, I, I, you know, kind of thought, you know, if I was to go straight into medical school, you know, I, I wouldn't have the experience that I wanted before school. And, you know, at the time I was like, I was pretty, um, I was pretty tired. Right, you know, I had been going to, you know, uh, K through twelve, high school, college, and I was like, do I go straight into medical school or do I take time to understand what really drives me? Um, so I decided to uh, take two years uh, to move to Washington D.C. and do uh, more research. Um, I really enjoyed it, but what I really found um, exciting was that there were so many opportunities outside of research for me to be involved in. Um, there, um, there were uh, volunteering opportunities, there were um, writing seminars, there were public speaking classes, there were networking classes. There were these things outside of my job to kind of, you know, if you kind of think about, you know, like a well-rounded pie to kind of help build out the other sections that I wasn't, um, wasn't as skilled in. And I took advantage of those opportunities because, um, you know, I didn't know if these were like one-time things or if they were yearly. Um, but I eventually, um, you know, kind of did a, a number of them, and I, I came out kind of a completely transformed person. And then I became more um, confident in my public speaking. I was comfortable approaching people um, that I hadn't been connected with, and kind of doing that cold introduction or that cold email. And it opened up a lot of opportunities uh, for me in that regard. Um, but the experience that I think probably sticks out with uh, me is that in my, towards the end of my first year of my post-baccalaureate fellowship at the NIH, um, the NIH director um, who just stepped down, Francis Collins, and invited me to be on a panel of trainees speaking to 
um, congressional lawmakers and sharing my perspective as a Native American uh, student interested in medical school or graduate school um, and just speaking to, you know, what what helped me, you know, what what hindered me, you know, what was the experience like? Um, because, you know, there's, you know, kind of this uh, kind of ever present feeling that, you know, you're the the only one or one of the few when less than 1% of physicians, less than 1% of, um, you know, graduate and doctoral degrees go to Native Americans. So, you know, depending on where you're going to school, that kind of isolation can be very, um, it, it can really weigh you down um, and uh, discourage you from going on. And I think many, many of you would agree is that if you don't see yourself at the end of this kind of tortuous pathway, you know, you start to kind of internalize it and say, you know, can I do it? Like, when will I finish? How much will it cost? Um, and those, those considerations are, are real and they should be, you know, acknowledged, answered, explored. Um, and, you know, I think when you talk to, you know, mentors or, you know, you hear advice from different webinars and programs, people tell you to, you know, to persevere, to become more resilient, um, that it's important that you keep going. Um, but that can be really taxing, uh, especially when you know you're the only one from the group that you um, when you come from. Um, and I, you know, I, I felt that way for a very um, a very long time. And then I think I told myself, um, or I, I tried to kind of shift it in my mind and said, you know, if I if I keep going, you know, my representation will be so. Uh, motivating for the people who come after me because they'll see that Alec Alec did it and if Alec did it then I can do it and then if they do it someone else will see that they did it and so it's kind of starting this kind of cascade right and um, you know it's it's still I think isolating in the sense of you know my medical school class of 134 um, I was I was the only Native American medical student and I would always have uh, faculty members, my friends ask me like, what, what motivates you? You know, why do you, why are you so involved in policy and research and advocacy and volunteering and public speaking and, you know, doing all of these different things that seemingly aren't connected? And I would tell them, well, they, they are connected because it's increasing the visibility of Native Americans in medicine. It's, sharing a perspective that has been historically disregarded or excluded, but is unquestionably needed. Uh, when we think about how um, indigenous communities, um, no matter where they are in the world, um, you know, there are about 200 million people who identify as um, indigenous in more than 70 countries across the world. It's about 6% of the global population um, thereabouts. And, you know, there, there are many disparities in, in these communities, um, not inherent to themselves, but really a consequence of um, things like uh, colonialism and structural racism and um, all these kind of structural barriers. But these communities um, and the knowledge that they have, um, they have solutions to problems that we face today, but unfortunately, you know, they're not in the room, you know, they don't get to contribute, um, you know, to that process. Um, so I have always thought it's important to, you know, be in the room to share your perspective to, you know, on Zoom, you know, unmute yourself, you know, put up, you know, the the raise hand feature. Um, because, you know, if you if you don't speak, you know, you you never spoke. And I think, um, you know, it's not just, you know, me, you know, representing myself, but me um, also advocating for the interests of my community. So if I don't say something, is that, you know, is that a disservice to my community? You know, if I, if I have an opportunity, why not, why not try and do something about it? Um, why not try and make something better? And 
Um, when I was applying to medical school and writing my personal statement, I was looking up, um, you know, like, what is the definition of advocacy? Like, I, I'm an advocate, I, I do a lot of advocacy, but like, you know, how do, how do other people view advocacy? And the quote that I found was, um, advocacy is to change what is into what should be. And I thought that was a very kind of simple, simple way of um, acknowledging the reality that we experience today, um, but also acknowledging that it doesn't have to be that way because we can improve it, we can change it, we can, um, we can reimagine it. And I think that's what is really powerful about advocacy is that um, you, know, you leverage people's lived experiences um, and their skills and knowledge to work for a better future. Um, and that's why, you know, representation matters. That's why, you know, diversity and inclusion matter because, you know, you start to approach um, problems from different perspectives when you have more diverse student bodies, more diverse faculty, more, more mentors. Um, and that has really been impactful uh, for me, because I don't, um, I don't necessarily purport to be an expert in any of the things I do. I think I was just kind of um, thrust into it, and you know, people thought I was an expert, and you know, instead I had this massive learning curve of, you know, trying to kind of you know read, read articles, read books, read, um, read all these things to understand that. You know, if I have an opportunity to say something, I should give the most informed answer possible. Um, and that's, um, I think, the power of advocacy is that you, know, you can, depending on what you say, you can, really, um, you can really make a difference. And that's the kind of passion that I took into uh, my time in Washington, D.C., uh, where I got involved with this um, nonprofit called the National Indian Health Board. And I was looking for a way to serve um, to serve my tribe in Washington D.C. Right, because I'm you know thousands of miles away. And they opened up a job or not job search, but a um, a um, fellowship application for their uh, youth uh, youth health policy fellowship, where you know they take you know youth ages. Um, like 14 to 24 and, um, you know, train them to become advocates for their communities. And I took part in this for a year while I was still doing research and applying to medical school because, you know, why do, why do one thing when you can, you know, when you can juggle, juggle everything. Um, that's not to say that I have great time management. Um, you know, there are only 24 hours in a day. And, uh, you know, if you, you know, if you work late, um, you know, you sleep a little bit less um, and, you know, you're like always on the move. So, you know, always try and make sure that you don't, um, uh, for lack of better words, bite off more than you can chew, uh, because that is a um, recurring uh, kind of theme in my life where I've definitely taken on too much and it feels um, burdensome, but then I eventually am able to kind of offload it. Um, so what the National Indian Health Board did was it taught me um, all the determinants of American Indian and Alaska Native Health or Native American Health, Indigenous Health, um, and solutions to address them. And they taught me how to, um, you know, take a complex issue, distill it down to a few bullet points to, you know, kind of present, you know, uh, my my ask, you know, what I wanted of, um, you know, a lawmaker or their staff member. And it was really um, an experience that got me further out of my shell, but also um, I think changed what I wanted to do in medical school because I, I thought that I would do, um, you know, a, my MD um, and whichever clinical specialty interested me um, or interested uh, that I was interested in. And then I would do a PhD in neuroscience because that was my background. But I kind of saw, you know, if I was doing an, an MD and a PhD in neuroscience, you know, the kind of connection between the two is, I think, a little, um, a little distant in that 
you know, your clinical work can certainly inspire the work that you do in research and your research can affect the way that you think clinically. But I thought that they were a little too far apart and that, um, you know, kind of on average, it takes, you know, it takes uh, five years, 10 years, 15 years for the discoveries that you make in a research lab to affect your clinical practice. So I, I thought that the pathway between these two hands was a little too distant. So I thought, you know, what can I do where my MD um, and PhD training are, are kind of like this, they're melded together where it can have very like immediate impacts. And the answer for that was um, public health or health policy, um, where health policy is a key um, kind of discipline in public health, um, where you, you know, kind of, you know, move, um, where you move upstream and start to think like, okay, if this is, if this is our situation here, why not, you know, go further upstream and address some of the more kind of structural determinants? Um, and that's where I kind of found my, my niche or kind of my interests. And, you know, I kind of expressed a little bit about that in my medical school application, um, in my interviews. And, you know, I think I was expecting that I wasn't that I wouldn't do really well um, for my like interview process because you know these can be very like nerve-wracking experiences where um, you know you kind of you know are sat in front of someone and they say like okay like tell me about yourself you know what what motivates you um, you know if you had a million dollars um, you know how would you how would you change the world and um, you know, I think some people like to prepare speeches, you know, and rehearse them, you know, constantly, you know, Google, you know, common questions. And I think that comes off a little bit um, inauthentic sometimes when, you know, you kind of sound like, okay, this person has probably like said this, you know, about like 20 times. Um, so my, my advice and something that has been very successful for me is, um, is just having the first sentence down. Um, and once you have the first sentence, you know, as you're saying it, you're figuring out the second sentence. And when you say the second sentence, you're figuring out the third sentence. And it's a much more, I think, genuine answer that you give because it's not polished. It doesn't have a lot of, um, a lot of, uh, you know, kind of natural flow. You know, it's, it's broken up. It's introspective. You learn to, um, effectively communicate a point. And I think that got me really far when I was in uh, the interview process. And for MD PhD students, it's a little bit um, a little bit different because you're talking not just about uh, your interest in medical school, but also your interest in research. Um, but ultimately, I was very fortunate to be able to come back, oh, I guess it's, I guess it's here, um, to come back to um, UC San Diego for my MD PhD because this is the same institution that said we're sorry but we can't admit you for college here um, you know please please try again and I think that was very um, it was it was very hard for me at the time to kind of accept that I couldn't stay home for college but I think that time away really challenged me to grow um, as an individual and you know as I said when I got to UC San Diego. Um, you know, I had all this experience in research and policy, um, advocacy, extracurricular work. And when I talked to my medical school, I was like, you know, what are, what are we doing for native health? And at the time they were like, well, not much because we don't have that many students. And I was like, okay, let's, let's change that. You know, let's, let's, you know, let's work for a more inclusive student body. Like let's, let's figure out why things are the way that they are you know why why does california have 12 percent of the native american population in the country but less than one percent of the state's medical students are native american and you know just having that that data having those figures can really you know make you a more effective advocate because people know that you've done the work to become familiar with an issue, you know, instead of saying, oh, like, let's, let's meet next week when you, you know, when you look into it a little bit more. It's like, well, we don't have to, because I already, I already know the answer to your question. 
And that can really kind of accelerate the pace of these conversations. And within two years, um, you know, we had developed um, a, a lecture series. We had funding for a student organization, um, the Association of Native American Medical Students. Um, we um, had uh, five incoming Native American students in the entering class of 20, um, 2020. And, you know, I, I think when you start to really have this kind of like critical representation, you know, people start to see, um, people really start to see things differently. You know, it becomes less about defending who you are or, you know, justifying your presence in a space that, you know, wasn't, you know, meant for Native Americans, um, you know, in the year, you know, 2022, but instead saying, you know, how, how do your, you know, beliefs and, you know, knowledge systems, how does your perspective um, influence the way that you wish to, um, you know, be a doctor? You know, how does it, how does it influence the decisions you make? Um, and it's seen as your culture and your, um, your background is seen more as a, um, more as a, an asset to your training rather than a deficit or a distraction. And unfortunately, there are still medical schools and you know, programs today that see, um, see Native American culture as a deficit or a distraction. It's, it's something that's unimportant. Um, but I, um, I always like to say I have this, um, I have this shirt that says um, uh, unapologetically indigenous um, because we shouldn't have to shrink ourselves in the spaces that we're in. You know, we should be our full authentic selves. Um, and, you know, I think that just speaks to who we are because who we are as Native people, because we're, um, we're proud of where we come from. Um, you know, we, we tell you where we're from. You know, I, I said at the beginning of this talk, um, um, you know, that means I am, I am Palma, you know, I'm from the Palma band of Lusania Indians. And, um, you know, the word Palma uh, translates to the place where there is water. It's both literal and that it's next to the San Luis Rey River here in uh, North County, San Diego. Um, but it's also figurative in that the people in our community um, carry, you know, carry the water, um, you know, for, for the uh, benefit of our people. But each person carries the water in a different way. Some people carry, um, you know, a few, a few cups. Some people carry a gallon, you know, everyone, you know, carries a different amount of water, but, you know, some people carry it um, on their sides. Some people carry it on their shoulders. Everyone carries it in a different way. And each way is important because each person is making a contribution um, and, um, you know, even though our community is, is rather small um, today, you know, just over 200 people, um, you know, we are firefighters, we are teachers, storytellers, language bearers, um, artists, educators, lawyers, um, professors, uh, doctors, um, you know, because every role is, um, is important. And for my uh, for me and my father, you know, that path was medicine, you know, healing. Of course, you know, we have been healers long before, um, you know, we had words for physician or doctor. Um, but in the modern sense, um, you know, we want to leverage um, the kind of advances that have been made in medicine and bring that back to our people um, so that they can live uh, long, healthy lives after generations, after centuries of being denied the right to a healthy life. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's what, that is what motivates me. It's, you know, how can I, how can I support my community with everything that I've learned, you know, everything that I've learned in um, in high school, in college, at the National in Institutes of Health, but also in, in medical school. You know, how can I, um, 
how can I, from you know, kind of this dual perspective of, okay, at UC San Diego, I am a I am a student, I am a trainee, you know, that has an inherent set of obligations, but I'm also a community member. You know, I'm I'm going to school where my tribe is. You know, I you know, have these kind of, and oftentimes the obligations or priorities of these two things are are different. So again, how can I how can I bridge them and make sure that the work that I have to do as an MD PhD student is also the work that benefits my community? And that's why you know I have such an outsized focus on um, on medical education, on uh, workforce development, on uh, misinformation, uh, COVID-19, because, you know, I can appreciate the disparities that exist in my um, community, but I also don't want to just identify a problem, but also to propose solutions. Um, and I think some of them are short-term solutions. Um, some of them, like, you know, doing, doing outreach, setting up vaccine distribution sites, other things take a little bit longer, like changing our medical school curriculum, identifying policies and programs that can promote greater inclusion of Native students at the university. Um, but also, how can we ensure that the students that we train will go and serve Native American communities? And I think this is a strong example. Um, and one of the kind of closing stories here is, you know, you know, thinking that, um, you know, if you've ever had um, an idea in your head and think, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a bad idea, I'm, I'm not gonna say it. Th think really hard about that and just, just say it if you're in a room and people ask you for an idea, because you, there's no such thing as a, as a dumb idea um, or a good idea or a bad idea. They're just, it's just an idea. And, you know, when you say an idea, you you may spark something in someone else's mind where it's like, huh, I didn't think about it that way. That's let's talk about that. Like, what do you what do you mean? And I had I had an idea uh, my second year of medical school and said, you know, we we are a university built on native land where we're not a, not just a public university. We are a land grant university. You know, land from uh, Native Americans was taken specifically for the purposes of establishing um, the University of California. So how can we go beyond a land acknowledgement and honor Native Americans in California? How can we address the most pressing needs in their communities? And I thought, we need to train Native American doctors at UC San Diego and give them training specific to Native American health and education. Um, you know, how can we do that? And I started, um, you know, being a full-time full -time student, full-time advocate, full-time community member, um, probably have like six full-time positions of, um, you know, things that I'm doing, um, you know, started meeting with, um, with staff and faculty, uh, deans, uh, chancellors and saying, you know, what, what can we do? You know, here's, here's, where, we, here's where we were in the past here's where we are now, how can we imagine a, a better future? And I said, you know, we have programs that do this already. Can we not just create a new one focused on Native American health? And I was told at the time, you know, it's, oh, it's too, it's too expensive. You know, we don't have the money, we don't have the capacity. And I was like, well, why don't we why don't we go to the state? You know, why why don't we try and get funding from, um, you know, from California? Why don't we get funding from, um, from a donor, from a, a a nonprofit? And you know, people were like, you know, that that could that could work, that could work, that could work. Um, and um, you know, perhaps um, perhaps it's a little uh, difficult. Well, it's it's hard. It's it's unfortunate to appreciate now, but um, you know, it it took a global pandemic, and it took um, it took a public health crisis that affected the most vulnerable in our society to show that our healthcare infrastructure, um, 
and especially among the most marginalized is is not the best that it could be then so, we really had to reinvest in education and healthcare um, to prepare for the future and because of COVID-19 suddenly um, my idea became more more feasible where it said okay like we we need to invest now in training Native American doctors to advance equity in Native American communities and you know I think no matter the circumstances that made that possible um, uh, last year we learned that uh, UC San Diego and UC Davis would receive millions of dollars to train uh, Native American doctors from uh, from Sacramento all the way down to San Diego. And it's the first, uh, I, I believe, the first state-funded program of its kind in California, specifically for Native American students, but also, I think, in the nation. And it's just because, as a second-year med student, and, you know, I'm now a fourth-year student, that I, I had an idea. You know, I saw something that should change, and I just offered an idea and you never know where that idea will take you and you know I think it's um, really exciting to be able to be a part of these conversations um, you know right now in my training because I think you're often told that um, you, know, you need to wait your turn or you know you, you don't know anything as a student um, you know your your perspective doesn't matter but it it does matter because um, you know, you, you shouldn't be told um, about what you're capable of doing by other people. Like only you know what you're capable of doing. So um, I think that has really represented my journey through, um, you know, medicine and research and health policy um, where, you know, it's if you can tackle a problem a day for the the rest of your life, um, there will still be many, many problems, um, but there will be that many fewer. And if everyone works on a problem a day, then we'll get that much farther. So what can we all do together? Because I think as strong as we are as individuals, we're even stronger when we form uh, coalitions or groups um, or um, you know, it's kind of committees that work to um, address the most pressing problems because um, you know if if not now when you know if if not us then who and I think so many of the problems that we see in healthcare and education have already been identified by those who came before us so why don't we try and address them today because um, you know we we live in the present so again let's do everything we can to advocate for a more equitable future um, so I don't I don't know if we have the Q&A feature um, but I'd be happy to um, you know answer any any questions or just you know hear what anyone thinks yeah, so um, go ahead and type in your Q&A questions so the first question was how much time? Did you dedicate to study for the MCAT? Any study tips or programs you recommend? Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. Um, I studying for the MCAT takes about three months, um, and I would say like it takes like three months like full time. So I was uh, I think I took about uh, probably about like six hours a day for three months. And I decided to purchase the um, the Kaplan. This is by no means an endorsement. Um, the Kaplan subject books on Amazon. I think they were just over a hundred dollars, but there were also, um, I think, uh, like friends and other um, ways that I could have obtained them. But I just wanted my own my own copy. Um, and you know, you kind of. Uh, it's it's hard to it's hard it's kind of hard to do without a, a diagram but essentially um you know like when you're first starting like studying you should be doing like you know if, like you if you imagine like a hundred percent like content review zero percent questions and then by the end of you know closer to your exam it should be flipped where you're doing 
like exclusively questions and um, very little content review. So it's kind of like a like an inverse scale where over time you'll start reviewing less content and you'll be doing more questions because the MCAT is all about taking the knowledge that you've learned um, and um, you know using it or applying it to a problem because um, I initially thought before I, I looked it up that the MCAT was exclusively um, uh, like uh, like sci like just kind of like factual questions. I didn't realize until I was starting to study for the MCAT that it's actually more um, more passage based. Like they give you you know a few paragraphs. Um, they give you like an experiment or like a study, and then they ask you questions about it. Um, and then at the end of like a science unit, then, you know, there are some questions that, you know, just kind of, you know, it's kind of like, do you know it or do you not know it? Um, so that's, um, that's what I would recommend there. Um, what I would say too is it's best to study with people because um, it can be really isolating when you study by yourself and don't have that kind of external accountability to really help you um, when it's, you um, you know, kind of uh, when you're feeling like really down or like you feel like you don't get something, it's really good when you can just ask a question of like two or three other people next to you. Um, you know, and this is when I was in, in college, like uh, just, you know, around a, a group of friends at a library table where I'd be like, I'd be like, hey, I'd be like, hey, take out your headphones. Like, hey, um, like, what, what did you think? So that's, uh, so that's my advice there. Um, I see a question, uh, here as well as did you pursue a PhD after you got into medical school? Um, uh, yes, I'm doing it um, at the same time. So um, uh, I've done half of medical school and then I started doing my PhD in public health um, in our joint doctoral program and global, uh, global health. So I'm doing it um, at UC San Diego and San Diego State. So I take, um, I'm taking, uh, I take a year of classes at San Diego State, a year of classes at UC San Diego. Um, and this summer I'll be proposing my, um, uh, uh, I'll be doing my qualifying exams and defending uh, my uh, thesis proposal and then just spending two years um, doing that. And then after I finish, I'll be going back to medical school. Uh, so it's a really, um, exciting time. It's a long time. It's eight years, but um, I have enjoyed every bit of it and I have no regrets. Um, I think this is a, along the the cap, the MCAT question is that, for instance, study books. I feel it's lacking. I wish I knew there was more class or interactive ways to study. Um, we had an MCAT expert who actually writes these study books. Um, he did like three and a half hours of things and I put the links in the chat. Um, I would really recommend, he has a lot of good techniques uh, that he's gone over and that's kind of his job now. But um, if Alec wants to share any any other thoughts that he had about uh, ways that he studied besides the groups or anything, he could share that. Yeah. Um... You know, I, I I forget the name of the resource. I think it's Khan Khan Academy. Um, yeah. I think I, I don't know if it's now behind a paywall, but I think um, I think they're still on YouTube or on um, on another uh, resource website. But um, you'll find that on YouTube, there are a lot of people who um, do like little like quick like MCAT like um, uh, like whiteboard tutorials. Um, and they're extremely helpful. Um, and for the most part, they are like very correct and like you can trust them. Um, and it's a good way of kind of getting like a quick like lesson on how to do something. Like, um, you know, if you look up a, a YouTube video on, um, on how to do um, uh, like uh, uh, looking at uh, like chemistry math, um, it's, extremely helpful to be able to, you know, do do stuff like that, because um, depending on the time, uh, depending on like if you're good at like doing standardized test questions, it can often feel like you have like no time at all, 
because you have to be very, very quick where people say like, okay, you have a minute to answer every question. And if you take more than a minute on a question, you take away time from other questions. Um, so it's, it's really important, not just to learn um, the content, but also to learn how to be a good test taker because I was not a great test taker by any means. Um, like growing up, and it took me a long time to feel comfortable, um, you know, with with um, you know doing kind of MCAT style questions. Um, another question here is how did you obtain clinical hours? Um, is um, uh, when I was at the National In Institutes of Health, uh, there were opportunities to um, to shadow neurosurgeries. Um, so I, um, you know, like every few weeks would shadow, uh, shadow a surgery. Um, and I would kind of, uh, you know, learn, learn from the surgeons, the nursing staff, and just kind of see how a team operated in medicine. You know, I wouldn't necessarily talk to, um, patients, uh, because they were, um, you know, being prepped for surgery, but I would get to learn, uh, from the surgical team and I would see how they all work together. Um, for the benefit of the patient and how they followed um, sets of procedures and protocols and, um, you know, had kind of this mix of like verbal and nonverbal communication, um, you know, see how, um, you know, nurses interact with surgeons, interact with um, anesthesiologists, with, um, uh, with uh, front desk staff and clerks. And it was, it was very interesting to kind of see how many people are involved with caring for just one individual. Um, and that's the kind of lessons that I took away from my clinical hours where I, I wasn't a, um, you know, a scribe in college or, you know, I didn't have like thousands of hours of clinical experience. And I think that's mainly because I had an MD PhD where I had thousands of hours of research experience but only like 36 total hours of clinical time. Um, so I think I was a competitive MD, PhD applicant, but I don't know based on my hours if I would have been a competitive MD applicant because I was so research heavy, not clinically heavy. Um, but, you know, it's different for everyone. So, you know, it's not to say that that's, you know, the best way to do it, but it's what worked out for me. Um, I like, can you, um, just, yeah. two, just two things. Can you tell them about, so the NIH, because not a lot of people know the NIH actually has a hospital. Yeah, um, yeah, definitely. And so to, to talk about a little bit about the NIH, because I don't think most people are aware of what the NIH is, besides sure. giving out money to do research, but mm -hmm. what, and I put the links in the chat of the programs that we, you were involved with. So people could go look at it, but just talk about that as an experience, just um, how you applied in the summer program versus the postdoc, the postgraduate program. What did you do there? What were your involvement, the process? Because um, I think a lot of people certainly, first gens don't even know what NIH is and what all the opportunities yeah. that are Yeah, there. definitely. Um, so trying to, it's, it's, it, I guess it's, it's easier now that I've done the experiences to explain what the NIH is. Um, so the, um, the National Institutes of Health um, is located in Bethesda, Maryland with other campuses in, um, uh, in North Carolina and in Arizona and uh, some other areas. And it's one of the largest, um, largest federally funded research agencies um, in the country, but also um, also the world. So um, with a budget of, you know, close to $40 billion, um, they are essentially responsible for funding um, biomedical research across, uh, across the country. Um, and they send out a majority of their funds to, you know, uh, to laboratories, to universities, um, but they keep a little bit of it uh, to fund research um, at their uh, at their campus. Uh, so uh, there's an opportunity for uh, for high school students, for undergraduate students, for um, post baccalaureate students to do um, internships uh, that range anywhere from 
um, eight to eight to twelve weeks, um, as well as uh, post baccalaureate fellowships that range anywhere from one to three years. Uh, to do research at one of the NIH's uh, 27 institutes and centers. Um, and, you know, you could, you know, be at an institute that focuses on, um, on neuroscience. You could do one that focuses on cancer, on aging, on, um, uh, on diabetes, um, on, on nursing, on more clinical medicine. Um, you yeah, know, there's, I mean, there's one for virtually everything. Um, and it's a great way to get a kind of world-class research experience, but to also get world-class, in, in, in my opinion, um, world-class mentorship where you are learning from some of the nation's brightest minds and they want to teach you. They want to um, give you the experience to succeed in no matter what you want to do. So typically um, applications open up um, in the fall um, and they're open for about like two, three months. Um, they you know, require the typical things where it's you know, like recommendation letters, uh, transcripts, a personal statement. Um, and you know, I always, I always say for the, for the NIH programs, but also literally any program, um, I am a happy reviewer of, the, of, of such documents. Um, so, um, you know, always, always feel free. I don't, I don't do I have access to the chat box yet? Um, you know, I, uh, I, I, I check my, I check my email very often. If you ever want to chat, if you, um, you know, need your personal statement reviewed, your resume reviewed, I mean, please, um, that, that is a very open email. Um, so happy to help in that regard. You know, I'm not at the stage of my career where I can write you a recommendation letter, um, but I can certainly help you with everything else. Or if you need connections or you know, mentorship or resources, always happy. Um, but it's a great, it's really great to uh, get involved at the NIH, not just because you learn a lot, but because um, being able to say that you trained at the NIH can open a lot of doors for you. Um, and it's, again, not just what you did, but also what you learned. Um, because that's what people often see in interviews. It's like, okay, how, how involved were you? How, how much of it was what you did versus what someone else told you to do? And you can really demonstrate skills like skills and competencies like leadership, communication, team building, um, and those kind of narratives that you have about the experience. Uh, so I would definitely recommend it. Um, I, uh, so I answered, uh, so I answered that question. Um, and I, and I, I know you don't have a name, but thank you. Thank you, iPhone, uh, for your, uh, for your comment. You know, I, I always say, obviously can't wait, um, because, you know, there's no better time than now. Um, anyone else? Love the question so far. I have uh, another question. So how um, how does it, so being, I mean, I think you're at a place now that you have a lot of uh, influence, um, certainly, you know, being on the speed dial for the White House, but. Um, <laughs> yes, I, I, I've, I've earned the influence. <laughs> uh, no, but how, when you were just a freshman at yeah. U of A sure. and struggling with chemistry, how did you overcome those? Um, um, how did you overcome those? Yeah, um, I, I went back to the source of the problem, my father, <laughs> and said, you know, like, hey, like, this is, this is not the right path, what do I do? And he's like, well, you're in Tucson now, go, go talk to an advisor. Um, so he kind of, you know, swatted me off. Um, but, um, you know, I, I reached out to, um, you know, the, the biochemistry advisor, the neuroscience advisor, I, I made a, I made a plan. Um, and that, you know, like, when I say like, make a plan, like, some people think the like, of this, like, beautiful, like, Excel document. I mean, my plan was literally like, a piece of printer paper and like just like copious notes um and that really helped me visualize what i had to do um 
And, you know, I think, you know, it could take some time to like figure out all those steps, but I at least was able to acknowledge the most important one, which was what I'm currently doing now will not work for me. Um, and that kind of, uh, that kind of acknowledgement let me, you know, kind of go down this pathway of changing, you know, my, my academic training. Because it's, it's not an issue when you change your major as a, as you know, a, as a first year student. I mean, so many people do that. Um, it's more a problem if you like change your major as like a senior, because, <laughs> um, you know, because then you might be adding you know, another year or two to your college training. Um, but I was going to college out of state where out of state tuition was uh, very expensive for student loans. Um, so, so don't be afraid uh, to admit that, you know, it may not be the right path, especially earlier on in college. Um, Cause it's, it's very easy to, you know, you're, you're right at the start of the trail. It's easy to backtrack and go down another trail. Yeah. So great, um, great question. The other question is how um, the first time, I think now you're more and more comfortable, but the first time that you had to be in a room with people that yeah. have higher degrees, more important, uh, yeah. how did you create a space for yourself? Because you are, you tend to be the only one yep. that represents your people. I mean, I, I probably would say that from your first freshman class, in college to medical school to everything else, how did you overcome those obstacles? Yeah, um, very, very simple. Or, I was going to say simply, uh, very, um, very straightforward. Um, I, um, yeah, I, I think the first few times, you know, I was maybe a little bit more quiet in those rooms. You know, I, I kind of stuck to very simple responses. You know, try to steer away from. Um, you know, saying things that are, you know, maybe, I don't know, controversial or a little um, pointed. Um, but over time, I, I started to say like, okay, what can I, how can I like stand in my power? Like, how can I, how can I really um, be unafraid in this moment, at least for like the 20 minutes that I'm sitting at this table. And I said, you know, I'm a, I'm a native student on native land like I like I like look down at my feet and I'm like this is our land um you know and this is just a an institution built on our land so really I I have the power um no one else does um at least from like a uh kind of a a, a, a decolonial perspective if you will um and that that really um that really got to me and I think that is the thing that has always got me through many of my meetings where it's like, you know, our, our land is our, um, our land is our health. And when we don't have, um, you know, access to, um, you know, health and education, like we should, we really have to remind ourselves that, um, you know, these are institutions built on native land. So, you know, we really have this um, moral, if not kind of like legal responsibility to educate the next generation of Native Americans in any discipline. Um, and that's the kind of argument that I present in, um, in my meetings. Um, another, um, excuse me, um, another question that we have is, um, did you ever face imposter syndrome? Um, I mean, who, who doesn't? It's just depending on who's open about it. Um, I have a very strong sense of imposter syndrome. Um, it's very internalized. Um, you know, I, I think, um, you know, much like, um, much like the concept of grief, um, you know, you know, grief never goes away. Imposter syndrome never goes away. You just grow around it and you, you kind of, you know, it, it kind of, it becomes small relative to everything else. So is it always in the back of my mind? Sure. Uh, but it doesn't bother me anymore. Uh, maybe at the very beginning, imposter syndrome really, really bothered me or, you know, getting, getting an award or getting a recognition. 
imposter syndrome. Um, you know, it's, it, you know, but I think it becomes like when you say imposter syndrome, where it's like, oh, I'm an, I'm an imposter, it dismisses all the hard work that you've done to get that recognition. Um, where, you know, if you, if you look back at the moments that led you, you know, to getting a particular, you know, honor or award, it's like, oh, okay, actually, I, I did a lot. Um, and it's always good to kind of look back at, you know, what you've done, because it can really show you how far you've come. Um, the other thing, uh, what are, how do you, uh, this is probably not the best question to ask, but how do you manage your time with everything that you do? Uh, this coffee? <laughs> <laughs> um, this, this double coffee. Um, I think having effective time management is incredibly important. Um, I um, I always like to say that, like, if it's like past like eight p.m., like I'm not going to respond to anyone's emails. Um, you know, if I, you know, if I, um, if I'm eating, like my phone isn't near me. Uh, if I'm, you know, uh, if there's nothing on my calendar, but I have a test to study for, I'm still going to watch a movie on Netflix. <laughs> um, because, you know, you have to, um, you know, like when you start to kind of say like, yes to all these things or start to kind of get busier with, um, you know, uh, your, uh, your academics, your extracurriculars, your you know, job if you have one, um, you know, you start to realize that you don't really have time to do much. Like you don't, it's like, oh, well, like, can, do I have time to eat? But it's like, you have to, you have to make time. Um, and I have become really good in the last probably two years, you know, motivated by, you know, doing, uh, you know, my, my PhD virtually is that you have to protect your time because so many people that aren't you, feel entitled to your time so sometimes you really have to set you have to set boundaries you have to just be you know honestly like you know no that meeting time does not work let's you know let's just talk about it over email there are a lot of things that we have meetings for that could be phone calls there are a lot of phone calls that we have that could be emails so um, I always like to say that you know when you're engaging with someone you know don't like be like on equal, like, you know, equal footing with them um, because, you know, it should be a shared decision. You shouldn't always defer to other people's preferences because they don't necessarily know your own preferences. Um, so come to a joint decision. And I think that is really effective for time management. Um, there's also another question here about, do you have advice for being an ally or advocate for other groups that may be different from uh, your own? That's an incredibly um, important question, and I'm glad um, I'm glad you asked it. So that's why um, I kind of brought up a point about the importance of you know coalitions and you know really um, you know bringing together uh, people with different perspectives because you know I acknowledge where my knowledge begins and where it ends, and I'm I'm not a, an expert on you know, I don't represent indigenous people or Native Americans are all American Indians, Alaska Natives. I represent, I represent me. And, you know, everything I said, you know, another Native American student might say something completely different. And that's okay, because, you know, when we come from such, um, you know, marginalized, but diverse communities, um, you know, you start to realize, like, we're not, we're not monoliths, you know, we all have different perspectives. Um, so, you know, my advice is always to, you know, not, not speak over others, but also, you know, don't speak about experiences that aren't yours. Um, you know, my father grew up on our reservation and he, he often speaks about what that was like for him, but I don't speak about what living on our reservations like, cause I've never done that because my you know, my father, you know, left to go to medical school and we grew up near it, but we didn't grow up on it. So I don't know what it's like. And I don't, you know, I don't try and represent what it is like because that, 
you know, really um, is a disservice to my community. So, um, so that's my, my advice is, um, and I guess the other piece of that is, um, you know, know when to step back so that others can, you know, step forward. Um, you know, you don't always have to be at the table. So if you think someone else would be better suited for something, invite them or suggest their name. Um, and that can really go a long way. Yeah, and I think there's this big concept in, in medicine is you see one, you do one, and you teach one. Yes. Um, so I think uh, be just be just you could always see somebody else do it, then you do it, then you teach somebody else because that's how um, it grows. Um, does anybody have any other questions? Because I have two more questions, but I want to. Okay, um, one of the other things is that, so you talked about how you dedicate your time to so like medical school for your studying. Do you protect your time? Uh, do you like to study in big groups? How do you, how have you studied in medical school with all the other things that you are involved with? Yeah, um, yeah, there's, there's no perfect answer for that because um, you know, medical school, depending on the time of year or where we are, can be very different you know, in terms of like what we're doing, um, but a mix of everything. Um, you know, some, like some things like I liked learning by myself, some people um, I loved, or sometimes I loved um, working in groups. Um, it just depends. Um, because everyone has a different learning style and that's okay. Um, perhaps in my second year, the best thing that I ever like started using was like electronic flashcards on this application called Anki. Um, and you know, I developed this like bad, um, I, don't, I don't know what, what do you call it? like not trigger thumb, but just like, um, like maybe like pseudo arthritis. Cause I was like always hitting like a space bar to like, um, you know, advance to the next flashcard. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, take my advice to that question really is um, experiment with different learning styles, um, especially very early on in, you know, in college and medical school and graduate school and find what works best for you, because this is a time where you have, you can do that um, and not really be penalized. Um, so find, you know, find the right combo, find you know, the right applications that, you know, work for you, you know, learn from other people's perspectives, but always, if you're in these, you know, webinars like this, ask people like what works for you. I just shared what works for me, ask the next person you hear speak what works for them. Um, and that knowledge can be really important. Um, and then um, in terms of um, adjusting to medical school, um, you know, uh, you know, your, your time can be really, um, your time can be really, um, you know, structured. Um, but I think compared to many other medical schools that I um, was applying to, UC San Diego trusted you to be your, to be, um, you know, in charge of your education. So, you know, our days are, you know, roughly like 8 a.m. to noon, Monday through Friday. It's a mix of lecture and small group. Um, but, by lunchtime, you know, you're, you're free, you're free to study, you're free to do whatever you want. So, um, you know, I really liked, you know, that kind of aspect of UC San Diego, where they trusted you to learn the way that you do best. Um, so, um, you know, my experience has been, you know, overall positive. Has it been perfect? No, um, but has it been overall positive? You know, are the positives outweighing any negatives? Certainly, and by, um, you know, and greatly. So, um, you know, if you want to learn more, just, you know, if you want to, you know, um, you know, talk more about UC San Diego, my uh, email's in the chat and certainly happy to um, talk to you about that. Yeah, and then making a plug for UCSD School of Medicine, we had the Dean of Admission uh, talk last night and we're going to post and if you didn't make it we're posting the video soon um 
my other question is how have you gone from um you know coming up you know advocating and not being taken seriously you know because i'm pretty sure a lot of times when you walk through the first doors you weren't taken seriously how did you push for change um and advocated for change yeah um and not know, well, obviously not being discouraged but yeah. you know i i think you know feelings of discouragement are are normal and you know should be it should be acknowledged i would say many of the meetings that i was in um you know they would often be like the same attendees or you know like people that i had already met with in previous meetings and i would say you know perhaps i was kind of discounted or kind of ignored at the beginning, you know, where I was kind of like the, the new student. Um, but I think over time, I, um, you know, I was, you know, like, I was like tolerated in that, you know, I, I think people started to see like, okay, like he's going to be in these meetings, and he's going to be sharing his perspective. And then, you know, meeting after meeting, month after month, I started to gain I started to move from like being tolerated to being respected. And then after um, after that, I moved from being respected. I mean, I've been here for four years now, um, from being respected to being valued. Um, and you know, you you have to you have to earn, you have to earn respect, you have to, you know, you have to demonstrate that you can be valued. Um, so it's it's been it's been a journey because you know it didn't come overnight. Um, and, you know, I, you know, I think I'm tolerated, respected and valued, um, you know, not by, I'm not valued by everyone. You know, some people tolerate me, some people respect me, some people value me and that's okay. You just have to acknowledge that your relationship with people will be very different, but you should always learn how to kind of work together because there's no point of you know, working against each other, you should always be trying to find common ground and advocating for your own priorities while also helping them with their own priorities. Um, and that is, um, that gets me pretty far. Awesome. Um, I, uh, I'm going to give everybody a minute. If nobody else has any questions of the type, we're going to let Alec go because uh, he has other important things to do, like rest and lunch, his coffee <laughs> and lunch. And um, so don't be shy. Uh, it's great if, you know, we always get MD PhD questions from people that are not MD PhD students or have done MD PhD. So ask away about MD PhD process and. Um, this is this is a question that's often asked for MD PhD. Um, I'm just going to ask you: um, How much research do you think you have to do to be an MD PhD applicant to demonstrate your commitment to research and and uh, and what your personal journey or story was? So at least in what I've and what I've like learned and um, I guess maybe also my own perspective is that the most like competitive MD PhD applicants had taken time off after college um, to do more research um, because that demonstrated to programs that they were serious about doing research as opposed to like applying as like a junior in college. Um, so definitely, you know, explore the utility of a postback or, you know, like a clinical research position um, because that demonstrates that, you know, you're, you know, you're serious about it. Um, and I think overall, you know, people look, look for, you know, like over a thousand, over 2000 hours of research experience. So your research involvement should be very significant. And it's not just, you know, um, you know, showing that like, you know, you were on a paper, or, like that you were a part of a lab, but also what you did in the lab and how, independent you were, um, something that comes up time and time again. And this is because I, um, I evaluate MD PhD applications at UC San Diego is, you know, what was your role in a project? Did you lead it or were you a part of it? Because those are two very different things. Um, so we always look for that leadership, um, you know, in recommendation letters and applications. 
Um, and again, my emails uh, in the chat box if you want to talk about that as well. Um, yeah. yeah. So yeah, I think I think the 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 biggest key from all the other themes of admission is that the BS radar is very baked. You know, they want to ask very detailed questions and the contributions that you have done. And every, anything that you do, not just research. Um, and so if somebody asks this question, how many hours of research did you do? That is not the right way, right? To look at that. That's, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not necessarily in what you did, it's what you learned. Um, you know, it's like, what, what was the process? Well, excellent. Well, um, we don't have any more questions, so I'm going to let you go. Um, and thank you again so much for making time for us. And.